He's back. Jim Morgan is our speaker today. Jim has lived a full life, and he's not finished yet. Uh, <laughs> 70's the new 60. Um, but he has accomplished a lot. His list of accomplishments and accolades is long, as you probably realize if you read uh, Sandy's email that included Jim's bio. Just in case some of you didn't read every word of Sandy's email, here are just a few things you should know about Jim. Jim Morgan served as chairman of Krispy Kreme Donuts from 2005 to 2016. He also served as president and CEO of Krispy Kreme from January of 08 until July of 2014. In a prior life, Mr. Morgan served as chairman and CEO of Wachovia Securities following the acquisition of Interstate Johnson Lane by Wachovia Corporation. He had previously served as chairman and CEO of Interstate Johnson Lane. Mr. Morgan is a past member of the Securities Industry Association Board of Directors and the New York Stock Exchange Regional Firms Committee. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of Coca-Cola Bottling Company Consolidated and the Board of Directors of Lowe's Home Improvement. Mr. Morgan is a 1969 graduate of Vanderbilt University. Upon graduating from Vanderbilt, he served in the U.S. Navy from 1969 to 1972. He concluded his naval career with the rank of lieutenant. He currently serves as chairman of Covenant Capital, the general partner of a hedge fund headquartered here in Charlotte. Mr. Morgan maintains a lifelong commitment to youth and education through his involvement with numerous organizations, including the YMCA, and we have a lot of folks here today from the Y, but also the Youth Commission International. He's an active member of Providence Baptist Church of Charlotte, Jim teaches a young couple's class there. He's been a Sunday school teacher for the past 45 years. He's a devoted family man. He and Peg, his wife of 49 years, reside in Charlotte. They have three children and four grandchildren. Please join me in a warm rotary welcome for Jim Morgan. show you something better than Blackberry. <laughs> We've gone from technology to type to Blackberry. This is the way I do mine. Can you see? <laughs> I, I, when, as I'm thinking of things, I scribble them down and, uh, and turn back to them later. I am, I'm going to tell you in all honesty, I, I had almost forgotten how special it is to be at y'all's club and to stand around for that 30 minutes and just feel the, the warmth and the fellowship and the way you enjoy each other and the sharing, it, it is special. So I'm more than delighted to be there. Parker, thank you so much for that prayer. That was, uh, I'd have come for that and gone home and been pretty doggone happy with my day, so thank you. Um, I will tell you this, I was down at the beach this past week with my wife and my, uh, part, my family that lives in Colorado, which include two girls, 16 and 13 year old granddaughters. And they heard me talking to Peg, Peg was saying, uh, are you kind of ready for what you're going to share? And I said, well, I know kind of what I want to share. I don't know how I'm going to say it, but I'm not sure how to open it. I'm not, I don't have an opening yet. And I know how important, you know, you're always told the opening is really important. And my granddaughters heard us talk and said, well, who are you speaking to? And I said, well, it's the, you know, Charlotte Rotary Club. Do you know what the Rotary is? And they said, well, we're not real sure. We've heard of it. So I um, told them a little bit about the four-way test and a little bit about the specific community projects that this club has been involved with over the years in Charlotte. And they listened, and here's what they came back with. And I wrote it down. As I said, I scribbled things down. This is in quotes. Just tell them that they are a bunch of nice people doing a lot of good things, and you are happy to be with them. <laughs> so my opening is, you are a bunch of nice people doing a lot of good things, and I really am happy to be here. Uh, Benton mentioned that this is not my first time here. The two that I remember in particular, one was in October of 07, where I was talking about, I was at that point chairman uh, uh, of Krispy Kreme, outside chairman, and we had some challenges. And so I was talking a little bit about the challenges. The challenges were, were pretty big. I mean, we were being sued by the Security Exchange Commission. 
Uh, we would be investigated criminally and civilly by the Justice Department, we'd be sued by our shareholders, we'd be sued by our franchisees, and we were being uh, sued by ERISA. So it was a pretty busy time in the life of Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and, and, and a real thrill to, to be the outside chairman. Um, what I didn't realize at that point in time was that within two months I was going to be stepping in as president and CEO. So the last time I got here, I told a different perspective. It was a few years ago, and I had just retired as the executive chairman of Krispy Kreme. And so the first time I talked about the challenges, the next time I sort of talked about the elements of our turnaround and shared that the keys had been probably in this order, faith, culture, and people. In essence, that's what I tried to share. And, and so now I'm here a third time, and I've got a few years of uh, hindsight perspective not only in my Krispy Kreme time, but my 50, almost 50 years in the work world. So this time, that's what I'm going to share. I'm going to kind of look back and share some things that I've learned, most of them the hard way, about leadership and about other areas that might be interesting to you and that you might be able to take out and do something with. First thing, I'm going to talk a little bit about leadership. And, and it pertains, Ben, to one of the questions you asked me, like who, who, was, who was critical to me in my formative years? Who have I learned from? So I'm going to give six individuals very quickly, and there have been others, but in no particular order, uh, maybe chronological order, uh, my father, and the reason the father was, my father was so important to me were many reasons, but what I learned from him in the world of leadership is that he had six children. He worked, you know, six days most weeks, and yet by the time we grew up, we realized that he had made every one of us feel like a special individual. He, we knew that he loved us as individuals, as siblings and as a family. And that's a great sign of leadership. Second was my mother. My mother had to raise the six children because dad was working so hard. And believe me, none of us were easy. Well, I, I, I was probably fairly easy. But uh, <laughs> the other five were a problem, let me tell you. So, so she did that. And I can honestly say to this day, in my years that my mother was on this earth, I never heard her raise her voice. And I never saw her lose her patience. So what does that mean? It means that she earned our respect. We knew she loved us. And we occasionally did the right thing, not because she made us or fussed at us and got an angry but because we knew if she was saying it, it was worth listening to. Great leadership that I had in my family. Third one that I would mention very quickly is during my time in the Navy, my second naval captain. My first captain was very hard to live with. My second captain was what I call the Colombo of the Navy. Am I dating myself? Y'all don't remember the television from Colombo, Peter Falk? Well, that was my naval captain. Rather than a raincoat, it was a khaki uniform. But believe me, it was just as rumpled and just as, you know, just as disarming. He was a great man. He made our 24 hours a day of work on that ship, we were deployed most of the time, almost fun. We knew that he cared about us. We knew that he put him, uh, us first. We knew that he would walk through walls for us. And because of that, we would walk through walls for him. Incredible leadership that I'll never forget. Next in line, chronologically, was one of my associates when I first went into the investment world in Greenville, South Carolina, a gentleman named Bill Poplin. Bill was actually from Gastonia. I was in Greenville, South Carolina. And what I learned from Bill is that he always put his clients first. In essence, in his life, he always put others first. And he cared about others' welfare, financially and otherwise, often at the expense of his own. And what a lesson that was for me to learn to put others first, not just financially, as he did in that industry, but in life in general. And it was a great lesson that I've carried with me. The fifth one was interesting enough, right here in Charlotte. It was the chairman who called me back to Interstate John Slane and allowed me to call me back as president, allowed me to eventually be CEO and chairman. And that gentleman's name was Parks Dalton. And some of you may have known Parks, but Parks, the quality about Parks that I'll never forget, it was he was the best listener that I've ever met. And you know, I think a lot of we don't think of leaders as being great listeners, or we don't realize how important that is, but he led by listening. And it was, it was amazing. He did not have to talk to make himself happy, and he didn't have to talk to make us respect him. So a great listener, great leadership trait that he had there. And the sixth one I'm gonna mention, and by far the most important, is my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I say that not to try to make this a religious talk, but just to tell the truth. Uh, I, I believe with all my heart, that he is the most incredible servant leader that ever walked the face of this earth. And I learn from him every day of my life and try to emulate it as best I can. So those are the six leadership traits that I was raised with and learned from over the years. 
And I'm going to tell you uh, one that I learned from that I didn't know the person, but it was, believe it or not, it was an article in Forbes magazine. Believe it or not, you can tell the paper's getting a little yellow, right? I've got to make a copy of this. Here's the article, Forbes, April 22nd, 2007. And here's the story. Some of you may have heard of John Ortberg. He's a, a minister and a, and a great author. His wife, Nancy, is an equally incredible person. So this is about Nancy. She was at one time an emergency room nurse. One night she witnessed an astonishing leadership act. According to her, it was about 10.30 p.m. The room was a mess. She was finishing up some work on the chart before going home. The doctor with whom she loved working was debriefing a new doctor who had done a very respectable and competent job and was telling this new doctor what he had done well and what he might could have done differently. Then the older doctor put his hand on the young doctor's shoulder and said, quote, when you finished, did you notice the young man from housekeeping who came in to clean the room? There was a completely blank look on the young doctor's face. The older doctor said, his name is Carlos. He's been here for three years and he does a fabulous job. When he comes in, he gets the room turned around so fast that you and I are able to get our next patients in quickly. His wife's name is Maria, and they have four children. Then he named each of the four children and gave each child's age. The older doctor went on to say he lives in a rented house about three blocks from here in Santa Ana. They've been up from Mexico for about five years. Remember, his name is Carlos, he repeated. Then he said, next week, I would like you to tell me something about Carlos that I don't already know. Okay? Now, let's go check on the rest of the patients. Orberg recalls, quote, I remember standing there writing my nursing notes, stunned and thinking, I have just witnessed breathtaking leadership. Leadership comes in all forms and all places from all people. And uh, it's, I think it's a critical element that every one of us uh, need to exhibit. So other than leadership, what, about, what are some lessons I've learned that might be valuable to some of y'all? One, as you're developing your career, as your children are developing their career, but for you and encouraging them, encourage them to pursue a passion. You can, you can live out your passion full time. You really can. And I know we're told to go out and have a certain role and a certain job and be in a certain aspect, earn money and get titles and be successful, et cetera, get known. But I'll tell you, I think that's the wrong thing to pursue. Good Lord put a passion, our passion's in us for a reason, and I don't think he wanted us to bury them. I don't think he wanted us to live them out as much as we could. And here's what I believe, if you live your life pursuing a passion, including your work life, one of two things will happen. Either because you're so doggone good at what you're doing, you're gonna have the wealth and the fame and the fortune and the titles, etc., Or you won't, and you'll be so doggone happy, it won't matter at all. That's lesson one. Lesson two, we talk about success a lot, and do I think we should strive for success? Absolutely. I can't imagine doing anything and not striving for excellence and not trying to be successful in what it is. But I think the key is what is your definition of success? And I believe with all my heart that success is not measured by what you do or what you accomplish. It's measured by who you are. And there was a famous poet who once said the following, it's very unlikely that people will ever remember what you said over time. It's even more unlikely that they will remember what you did over a period of time. But the one thing that I can say for sure is they will most certainly remember how you made them feel. It's who you are, not what you do. Third lesson, and I've, I, a couple of these I mentioned in one of my other talks, but I just think this one's so important. Don't get sidetracked or don't get stopped by some end in the road and some barricade on the path that you're on. I think you, what we've got to do, when you've got an unexpected end, uh, uh, an undesired end, look at that as an opportunity for a new and exciting beginning. And the saying that I use to go with this is one that I've heard a long time ago, and that is this, a bend in the road does not have to be the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. So I've learned sometimes you've got to make some turns. If I told you the paths I've dreamed that I would walk in my life versus the one that the Lord led me on, Number one, they weren't even close to each other. Number two, the one he took me on was so much more incredible than anything I could have ever dreamed of. Fourth, we all talk about the wisdom of hindsight and it's there and it's visible and obvious. The only thing I would share with you about the wisdom of hindsight is 
I think it's an incredible tool from which to learn. I really do. But I think it's a terrible, terrible tool to use from which to judge. So keep in mind those big differences. And that includes yourself. You know, don't spend your life saying, I could have, should have, would have, have. Just say, you know what? Might have done it different. What have I learned by doing it the wrong way or not as well as I wish? And move forward with that experience and that knowledge. Learn from it. Don't judge from it yourself or others. Tied into that is one that I had, a, this one I had the hardest time with, one of the hardest times. And that's learning to treat yourself the same way you would treat your own best friend. And what do I mean by that? When your best friend messes up, I can almost guarantee you, you are to their side, you're, you're comforting him or her, you're, you're encouraging them, you're reminding them of all the great things they've done, you tell them tomorrow's another day, all the things that you would do. I don't know about you, but when I mess up, I'm not quite that nice to myself. I'm saying, you stupid so-and-so. <laughs> how, how could you have done that? How could you have made that mistake? You should have known better, etc. Learn to treat yourself just as well as you do your own best friend. Simple one you've heard a hundred times. You cannot always control your circumstances, but you can always control your attitude within those circumstances. Really important. Really important. There's no saying that your attitude controls your altitude. Then control that attitude, and that altitude will be where you want to be. Next one, and this is, I think, very important, and that's what I love about Rotary, because I think you do this. Culture is the number one most important foundation for your corporate workplace and for organizations like this. Having a common culture, a positive culture, one you believe in, one you share, one you get excited about. Upon that foundation, you can then build vision, strategy, and tactics. But I will tell you, if we had gone into Krispy Kreme, for example, or for that matter, Interstate Johnson Lane, and we decided our most important thing was to get things going right, and we hadn't taken time to get to know each other, to care about each other, and have common denominators, and get excited about the future together, and decide who we were going to be to each other, and who we were going to be to others. No vision, no strategy, no tactic in the world would have led us to where we went. Culture is critical. It is the foundation. Here's one for today's world, talking about Blackberries and uh, iPhones, etc. Whatever you do in this world of technology, do not let technology replace relationships. Don't let them become the relationship. Don't think Facebook, emails, text, etc., are all you need to keep your friendships and keep, keep things going. Because if you haven't heard voice tones, if you haven't seen facial expressions, if you haven't been with people, then you're missing it and those relationships are going to die out and they are the core and foundation of life. So I'll give you an example. I mean, if you've got a third grade teacher that changed your life, I do, find her and tell her. And don't do it by texting me. You find her or him and you get in touch with him or her and you tell them, just want you to know that 20 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever, you changed my life and I never really thanked you. If you've got the same great aunt that I have that sent you a pair of socks you didn't want every Christmas and every birthday or a sweater that she hand knitted, whatever it may be, you know, she's still around, get in touch with her. And say, you know what, I never thanked you for never forgetting me. For, thank, for remembering me and giving me a gift. I don't know who it is in your life that you need to communicate with, but you've got to do it by building a relationship. It needs to be voice and or face. Don't let technology eliminate that from your life or from the people you care and love from their lives. Next to last, never move forward at the expense of your faith, your family, or your friends. And let me tell you what's important about this. You can do it inadvertently. When Parks Dalton came to my door and asked me to come back to Interstate Johnson Lane, one of the things Peg and I were most excited about was telling our about eight or nine year old twins that they weren't going to have to move to Greenland, South Carolina, where we thought we were going. That, was no longer, that wasn't ever their home. It had been our home. So when they came home from school on the day that we were going to make the announcement, we said, guess what? We're staying in Charlotte. Dad's going back to Interstate Johnson Lane. You get to stay here, play with your best friends down the street, et cetera. Boy-girl twin. Little boy just shot out the door, ran down the street, to tell his number one, number one friend, Philip, that he wasn't going to be moving, that they were going to be playing together, going to school together, etc. Our daughter, who also had a best friend in the street, did not. She slowly walked to the steps and we saw her going up toward her bedroom. And I looked at Peg and she looked at me and said, what was that? And I said, well, let me, you know, Dad can fix everything. Let, <laughs> let me go upstairs and I'll explain to her. I don't think she understood what we were saying. So I go upstairs, she's sitting, I'll never forget it, she's sitting across on the bed, her feet hanging over the side, crocodile tears coming down. I got on my knees, I took her little hand, and I said, sweetheart, I said, Anna, I don't think you understood what Dad said. 
I'm saying we're not going to move to Greenville. We're going to stay here in Charlotte. I'm going back with the Interstate of Johnson Lane, and you're going to be able to go to the same school, have your friends, etc. She looked at me in a way that only a child can do, and she said, Dad, I think you're the one that doesn't understand. Last time you were with Interstate Johnson Lane, I never saw you. Don't ever, ever, ever put yourself in a position where a loved one of yours can even think that, much less say it. All that time when I was working, who knows how many hours a week in that job in Interstate Johnson Lane, I thought it was doing something for my family. And what I learned in that moment, that I was doing something to my family. And the difference in those prepositions is enormous. Do not let your work, your career get in the way of your faith, your family, or your friends. And the last thing is, and this is for those of us in here that are Christian, but it may apply to other faiths with your God, but I will tell you this, we've got to remember to do all that we do in his will and for his glory. And if that's an overriding thought as you're building your life, you're going to have a great, great, great life. So I haven't shared those lessons that I learned and on leadership and generically. Here's my closing thought. And it pertains a little bit, Parker, to it, some elements of your prayer. Um, I'm 70, and I think in many ways the world has got more divisiveness in it uh, than ever in my lifetime, everywhere I look. And it's painful. It's painful for all of us. And here's what I hope each one of us in this room, including myself, will do going forward. I think we need to recognize that our neighborhoods need us like never before. Our workplaces need us like never before. Our city, this wonderful city of Charlotte, needs us like never before. Our state needs us like never before. I know that our country needs us like never before, and therefore the world needs us like never before. So what I want us all to do is commit that when we walk out of here today, we're going to do all we can to make sure that during the course of my day, somebody's life is going to be enhanced, it's going to be richer, it's going to be better because we were on this earth today. And if you wake up tomorrow morning and you realize you didn't do that today, then just double your efforts the next day. Because if every one of us are going around trying to enhance, enrich, and improve the day of the person we meet, it could be a stranger on the elevator that you speak to in that time of deadly silence, you know, when you're on the elevator with a stranger. Could be a cashier in the store, and he or she has just been rude to you, and you tell them you sure hope they have a great day. It could be anything like that. But don't go to sleep at night if somebody's day hadn't been better because you were here. And I think if we do that, if we, if we walk out of here looking for every possible opportunity like that, and for every possible opportunity to make a difference, then it's very possible that someone's going to be standing out there watching, and they're going to say about us, I just witnessed the most unbelievable scene. I just witnessed breathtaking leadership. Thank you very much. We, so we have time for questions. Terry. I told Jim that uh, people would be in here that remembered when you brought us Krispy Kreme donuts for each table. So uh, we forget that. I, 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 I missed out on the donuts, but I did tell Benton, I did bring a tie in case I was out of place for that time. So I would have a thanks to, to uh, those of you who didn't wear a tie, because I saw enough of you that I decided I didn't need to put mine on. By the way, those of you that are, are dapper and wear a tie, I would be ready to join you if need be. So. Thank you. Yeah. I will hold these lessons close. I uh, thank you very much as well. What did you think you would be when you started out? What did you think you would end up? And what changed or didn't change all the way through the process? I think when I started my path, I was in the investment business. And I, uh, I believed I was going to be the best at that that ever lived. And probably thought I'd be famous and rich and all the things that in the, in the, in the naive, naive day of your youth that you think you're going to be. Uh, but uh, I, part of my story is that I basically uh, 
failed at that at one point, tremendously. Uh, I had a year so poor for my clients that if I had tried to create a year that was the worst in the world, I couldn't have created a year as bad as what I actually did. And, uh, and it was a rude awakening. That's one of my first dead ends that I hit. I realized that I wasn't, I wasn't following his will, I was following my will. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed that a lot of times um, success and arrogance seems to be synonymous. What has kept you humble? Knowing that it wasn't my success. Uh, it was the success flowing above, the success flowing by the incredible people that I was, you know, fortunate enough to surround myself with. I, I, my, and then, at, at Krispy Kreme, I'll be honest with you, I, my job was a people job. I mean, all I really did was get people to, uh, I, I told them, get people to believe in themselves again. Because it was, the stock had dropped from 50 to about a dollar when I got there, and the world was saved with out of business. So they needed to believe in themselves, they needed to start believing in each other. The, the, the company, the product, the brand, and then through all that, believe in the future. And I had had great people out there you know, as operators and technicians and tactical people, et cetera. So uh, I, I learned a long time ago I am not very good by myself. Yes, sir. You mentioned the importance of culture within a company. How do you foster that? How do you build that throughout a company, especially coming in uh, uh, new to the company? Yeah, I, I, I believe it. I, I know the sentiment. Was it easier to do in the role that I had? Probably, but I'll tell you, give me an give, give example of what, one of the greatest things that happened in our culture. So I had a young man, that, and technically we didn't look at graphs and charts, and our company, we decided we were all the most important person in the company doing what we did for the company, so we didn't worry too much about boxes. But if you had done one, this young man would have been four or five levels down. And he came and he said, I want to do a daily devotional and put it on my internal email. And I went to our attorney, and I said, I, I love it. I mean, I love that you want to do that to me, but I don't know. We're a public company, I don't know. So I went to our attorney, and I don't know about y'all's in-house counsel, but ours were always been nicknamed Dr. No. And so <laughs> I went to Dr. No, and he said, no, you can't do that. And I said, well, Daryl, let me, let me word that a little bit differently. I want to do this, would you please tell me how we can? And what he said was, we came back and said, yep, you can do it, but nobody can be on that mailing list that hasn't asked to be on it. And so that Dwayne Johnson had as much to do with changing our culture as any one person in that company, and he did it. And there's another, Warren, another person named Warren who started a Bible study, and his Bible study grew so big, it was all fighters, so big that I asked him to move his Bible study to our boardroom, which was sort of a forbidden room, you know, and the company was treated like, you know. And I said, I want you to meet in there. And he said, why? Do you need our conference room? And I said, no, I need you in the boardroom and I'm asking a favor at the end of every meeting, I want you to pray for our board. And so that was two different people that the impact they had was just beyond words. Yeah, Bill, and then Mike. You know, it's interesting you put it that way because had you not supported that, it would never have happened. Had you not taken it to the attorney and asked, how do I make it work, instead of how do we not? And that, so that, my congratulations to you on that alone. Thank you. Mike. Uh, Jim, how, how old were you when you became a Christian? A real Christian. Thank you. I was going to tell you that when I became a Christian, in my mind, was when I was eight years old and was baptized. Okay. Uh, my life has been a pilgrimage. And when I became a Christian, well, I was in my early 30s. I'd been teaching Sunday school for 10 years. I was in my early 30s, and that's when things went basically belly up. Peg and I moved into a bigger house. We had a bigger car. We just adopted two children, and my world came in. And I went to the beach to retreat a friend's house. I couldn't afford to go to the beach. And it was rainy and cold, and I hit my knees on that bench after trying to figure it out myself and just said, Lord, I'm yours. I thought I'd done all this on my own, and I know I didn't, and I'm not asking for a miracle. I'm just yours. And that's when I found my true faith, and that's when I get to understand the Holy Spirit within me. Yeah, please. And then Bob. Great. Um, you mentioned a third grade teacher had a real impact on you. Would you mind sharing a little more about that and where you went to elementary school? I went to elementary school at Augusta Circle School in Greenville, South Carolina, which is still there. Now, I think it's being propped up, you know, with, with various physical things, but her name was Miss Wirtz, and she, uh, she made every day wonderful. She was known throughout. If you got Miss Words, you knew you were in the right class. 
But what happened was uh, I had an appendicitis attack at school, and, and the way she responded and reacted and cared for me, who knows, maybe it was life-saving. So a special moment. And then Roger? What the of Krispy Kreme today in view of this competitive environment, fast food? It's a great question. I'm not really up to speed. What happened was I was supposed to stay on the board when the private equity group bought us out, but I learned that wasn't a good place for me. Uh, <laughs> they were going to make a lot of decisions that I wouldn't agree with, and I think hanging around would have been a bad on my part. But I would tell you, they are. They just bought a, a cookie company, uh, and I think they're thinking that they're going to change the place a little bit and do a lot more delivery and a lot more catering and that type of stuff to try to help compete with all that's going on out there. And the international expansion is still going right. Roger, then her. Thinking back to the time when things were really bad at Krispy Kreme, when you had all the lawsuits and you were being investigated, presumably you had a really clean house. How did you reconcile that with your values and hmm. your, your approach to try to build your staff? That's, support your staff? That is a, I struggle with that. I mean, that's my, one of my weaknesses. Did you repeat? Yeah, the question was, how did I handle the fact that we had to do a lot of cleaning of house when I first got at Krispy Kreme, and cleaning house means letting people go. And um, there were a couple of things that I did. Every night after I'd had some of those hard meetings and passed that word down, I would, I, rather than putting in front of me the face of the person that was no longer going to be with us, I put in front of me the faces of the people that were going to be able to stay and have a chance because of these changes. And it wasn't more so much a rationalization, it was a way to let my live with it and, and, and go to the next day. Uh, I, I think it was easy for some of them because some of them, quite frankly, had just done some bad things. It was hard on others that, that were there and were good people and hadn't done bad things but just weren't capable of helping to get to the next level. One thing I did learn, and that is the two biggest enemies of a turnaround like that are complacency and mediocrity. And I don't mean people are not mediocre, okay, but their actions can be mediocre. And so we had to clean out anyone who was complacent that didn't realize how hard they went to work, anyone whose performance was at a mediocre stage. And I just had to, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't keep, I hate to keep being so religious, but I had to pray about it every night because it hurt. It hurt. Herb, Herb, close us out. What's your opinion in general of the use of private equity capital in American business today? <laughs> As you know, it's all over the board in terms of who the people are that are controlling that private equity. Uh, I think there's a great place for it. I think that it is. Uh, <coughs> I think the advantage is that I would rather manage a private company than a public company any day. So are you trading in being public and all the masters you serve there with a private equity group that's going to allow you to be what you can be? Or are you trading in for a whole new set that in some ways are more difficult? And so I, I can't give you a clean answer on that. I think there's a great place for it. I think if I were a company and I was being looked at by a private equity group, I'd do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of homework. Give yeah, Jim a big round of applause. Thank you. And uh, uh, kind of closing on technology, uh, my mother uh, in Sarasota, Florida, will likely see this tape. Uh, I was the oldest of six kids, and Jim, like you, I was the model child. And so, uh, Mom, when you see this, what he said about moms. Uh, next week, Jay Bryson, who is the chief international economist at Wells Fargo, uh, will be speaking to us. Uh, there's no need for you to come if you know pretty much what's going on in the world uh, economically. <laughs> but if you don't or if you've got questions, I think it would be a good time for you to show up. So uh, that is what we have planned. Uh, we're going to meet uh, in the back uh, uh, to talk about the uh, uh, Central Piedmont uh, Connectivity Initiative, and we are adjourned.